know that submission to be godly needed to be loving submission. And we saw that a part of love is submission. It's giving that right away. Not because somebody happened to be right, but to keep from having a, a total wreck and giving you the opportunity to continue to work with somebody and letting somebody see the faults of their own sins or the faults of their own mistakes. All of that put together, Paul walks us then into standing our ground. He moves into some military terms in this sixth chapter, and he speaks to us not about running away, not about hiding, not about tucking tail and running. But he speaks to us as born-again believers in the world in which we are living right now about firmly setting our feet upon truth and standing our ground for the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll not do that without the filling of the Holy Spirit. And we'll not do it without loving submission. And so he picks us up in this 10th verse and he begins to talk about pieces of armament, pieces of, of uh, clothing that a soldier would wear. And as he talks about those pieces of clothing, he relates them to a spiritual truth. He is seeking to get his point across and gather his audience together who had been scattered by so much deception and so many false religions. And he was getting the church at Ephesus to stand its ground for Jesus Christ. The very same thing that we need today here in our country with so many false religions, so many untruths being broadcast across our land. We, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, need to stand firm and stand our ground. So I want us to look at this. And we're going to break it down into the, to the ideas of the armor. And we want to look at the power of that armor. We want to look at the protection of it. And we want to look at the provision of it. And I put it in those three categories because of the way that Paul writes about these pieces of armor. Now, beginning in verse 10 down through about 15, he's going to talk about three pieces of armor and... We're going to keep them separate too because he separates them. So let me pick up in verse 10 with you. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong. And we need to take that to heart this morning. It's words that echo all the way back to God speaking to Joshua and Moses. Be strong in the Lord. Be courageous. You and I as Christians today are being called upon by God to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You have already seen that your physical power and your, even your physical intellect will not, uh, is not sufficient to fight the battle that you and I are in. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now as he speaks about these first three pieces of armament, Paul uses a phrase in this passage which speaks about something that we take upon ourselves permanently. These first three parts are, he is not speaking to us about something that we put on when we need it and we take it off when we don't care about it. But he's speaking about elements of our Christian life that we take upon ourselves 
and that they should remain there forever. They should be permanent pieces of our daily life. And we want to look at them. Now, he reminds us in this passage twice that we are not running, we are standing. We're standing firm. He reminds us in this passage that it is a spiritual battle that we're facing. We're not fighting physical people. We're not out here slugging it out in the streets with our neighbors. This is a battle against the principles, the powers that be, the evil powers of this world. Satan and those fallen angels that we would call demons... Those spiritual elements that fight against us, that send those penetrating thoughts into our minds, those filthy thoughts, those evil thoughts, those thoughts of hatred, that, that, compa- uh, that compulsion that comes upon us to reach out in revenge and to strike out, that aspect of trying to tear us apart from family and limb, it's a spiritual battle. It would be more comprehensible to you and me and more practical if we could literally grab a hold of somebody and beat them down. That's what we like to do in battles. That's the reason men like wrestling so much on television. They love to see two opponents just beat it out on the mat. They, they say, if I could just do that with my boss, if I could just do that with my neighbor. But our battle, as Paul is describing, is not a physical battle. It is a battle in the spiritual realm. And we must fight it then with spiritual tools and spiritual armament. That is the only way to defeat our enemy. Satan loves it when we spend all of our time arguing with other individuals, fighting between ourselves, tearing apart the structure of our world. He loves it when we spend all of our time doing that because we're not fighting the real battle. We're fighting a make-believe battle. He has thrown us into this battle with each other and we physically fight it out when we need to turn and fall upon our faces and fight a spiritual battle. Now, let's take a look at that for just a moment. He tells us in verse 13, we don't just take up a piece of the armor, but he's told us twice that we take up the entire armor. We put every bit of it on. And it's only with the whole armor of God that you and I will be able to stand. Now, you and I all understand that we've fallen. Everybody in the room has at some time in your life committed at least one sin. You've yielded to temptation. You've made some wrong decisions. You've You've reached out in hatred or bitterness and anger. You fall in some way. You and I have all fallen. And we look back at our mistakes, at our sins, at at the destruction that we have committed. And we say, my goodness, if I would have just thought for a minute. If I would have just done something differently. Our 2020 hindsight kicks in. And we shake our heads and think, woe is me. So he tells us in this passage that he is giving us directions on how to stand strongly, firmly in the power of God. Your power is not sufficient. We all know that. We've all fallen. We've all failed. We've all thought things we shouldn't. You and I recognize our weakness. And so we need to give up on our weak strength, and we need to rely upon the strength of God to fight this battle that we're in. So he picks us up, and he first talks about having girded your waist with truth. Now, we can talk about the girdle all we want to, the belt and so forth, but the truth, the the word truth is the main word here. Quickly, to To tell you, they wore a a garment that was generally square. It had a hole cut in the middle. They put their head through that hole, and if they needed some holes for to stick their arms out, they did. If not, the, the pieces just draped around them. They would then put a belt around that because it would be a flowing type garment. And if they were going to do any type of work, or if they were going to go into battle, They would fold all of that cloth up, 
put a belt around it so that it would not get in the way of them swinging their sword or using uh, their shield or running or those type things. And so he talks to us here about what a soldier did to prepare himself for battle. He would gather all of the loose ends up, all of those things that could entangle him. He would pack them in and put a belt around them to keep them from being in the way. And so he tells us in this passage then that we are to gird our waist with truth. That we, our life, we are to wrap around everything in our life, truth, God's truth. Now we're talking about a very interlocking power here. We're talking about something that integrates things, that pulls things together in our lives. Our lives should be characterized by, by the fact that something holds all of our life together. It's, it's, it's not just a bunch of little pieces that fly around everywhere. So he's speaking to us about the truth of God's Word. He's speaking about truth as a character trait. That our lives should be characterized by the fact that we tell the truth, we live the truth, we are people of integrity, so we should bind up our life with integrity. If we're going to stand firm, we cannot be known as a liar, as a cheater, as a backstabber, as, well, you can't trust anything that feller has to say. Well, you know that woman's the biggest gossip, and she just tells lies all the time. She don't know whether it's true or not. Those type statements cannot be the character of our lives. So Paul is saying that we need to empty our lives of those lies, and we need to gird up our lives. We need to bind up our lives with truth. If it's not the truth, then we shouldn't be telling it. If it's not the truth, then we shouldn't be living that way. If it's not the truth, then we should not be believing it. We live in a fantasy world today. We're, we have adults that spend their lives in front of a, a fantasy game on a television. I, I'm, I know adults right now that when the new game comes out on Xbox, they take a vacation day at work, and they stay home all day to play that game. Now, you can laugh at me if you want to, but it might be your lawyer or your doctor that's doing it. <clears throat> uh, I, I, can, I could name you a banker right now that does it. And, but they are caught up in a fantasy world. Uh, my, uh, my son is a, is a counselor uh, on the north side of Atlanta. And he shares with me, he says, Dad, I sit there with a, an 18-year-old and his mother, and his mother says, I can't get him away from the television. He's failing three and four grades in school. He won't graduate from the 12th grade. He wants to come in and play this, this game until midnight. I can't get him to do anything else. What do I do? And he said, unplug it. Unplug it. There's a cord behind it. It plugs into the wall. Unplug it. She said, that's too simple. <laughs> he said, then I can't help you. But unplug it. But a fantasy world is what we are caught up in living in. We live on our laptops. We live on our phones. We live on, in games. A fantasy world. A make-believe world. And then we step away from it and we want to live in a fantasy world. We want to live in an untruthful world. We want to tell things that are bigger than us. Things that are not true about us. We want to project things to the world. Paul said you can't do that and stand firm in your spirituality and fight the schemes of the devil. He said first and foremost, and he said you got to put it all on. He said you've got to be a person of truthfulness. So what I need you to do this week is to talk to the Lord and ask Him, Father, 
any area of my life where I'm not a truthful person. I need you to show it to me. I need you to reveal to me personally the areas of my life where I am not truthful. Where I just kind of fudge a little bit maybe. Or maybe I'm the person sitting in front of the Xbox at the house. Or maybe I'm the person that lives in the dream world that just doesn't look at the bills that come in as if they're going to just float on out the window. Lord, bring me back to reality. Bring me back to what is truth. And make of me a person of integrity. Let the words that come out of my mouth be truthful. Let my actions be truthful. Let my life be seen as characterized as a person of truth. You might have less to talk about than you did before. But that's all right. What you do say will have weight to it. It'll have value to it. I'd rather talk to somebody who knows the truth and can speak the truth than somebody that's just full of hot air. I'm one of those people that just tell me the truth. Just give me the facts, and we can go with it from there. Paul is looking at his church at Ephesus, and he said it's time, if you're going to stand in this battle, you've got to be people of truth. It's time for us as a Christian church to lay aside the liberal notions of this world and to look back at God's Word and to be truthful once again. Now, he then says, once you've girded your clothing, once you've pulled your life together, and your life is girded, it's supported, it's held together by truth, not lies, he says, having girded your waist with truth, then having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, of course, covered them from right here under their neck all the way down to their below their waist, front and back. And so this breastplate was to keep out the, uh, the darts, the arrows, the swords. Any, it was to knock off anything that, that may have hit them. They would actually take like pieces of uh, horse's hooves and just kind of uh, sew them into this, this breastplate, something that a sword would maybe bounce off of or that it would be hard to cut. Anything, even, even pieces of metal, but, you know, it, they couldn't get it, make it weigh too much. They had to wear the thing. Now, being righteous, the Scriptures already teach us that you and I, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were made righteous by Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God. It, it's part of our salvation. We were made right before holy God. We could not do that ourselves. So we would say that positionally, you are righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul is talking about standing here. He's talking about not positional righteousness, but the righteousness that we practice each day of our life. He's talking about practical righteousness. And that would be this, we put on a breastplate of righteousness. We can boil it down to being obedient to God's Word. You see, we take God's Word today and we read it, and then we say, that was 2,000 years ago. That was 3,000 years ago. That was 4,000 years ago. This is 2014. Things are different today than they were back in those days. And so we can't do what the Bible says because we are 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years into the future. We're smarter people. We are more developed people, and we project ourselves as being greater and better than the people in the past. And so we, we take God's Word and we cut away from it until we get it down to the way we like it. And then we say, well, I'm going to be obedient to that, those pieces that we like. Well, Paul is saying that if we're going to stand firm and fight the battle, that Satan has not changed in the last 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years. He's still the snake in the grass that he was back in the Garden of Eden. 
He's still the liar. He's still the slanderer. He's still the cheat. He's still all of those things. And that what God has said in his word is just as good today as it was back then. And so we are to put on a breastplate of righteousness. We must practice this truth that we've girded ourselves with. We do that by being obedient to the Word of God. We must once again pick up Ten Commandments and learn them and teach them to our children. We must once again look into God's Word where it says yes and no and follow that yes and no. God is going to speak to us through His Spirit, lead us to do this or to do that, and it becomes an act of obedience again. We put on obedience. Obedience to God is not something that we just pick up when Grandma gets sick and we want to pray for her. And when God has gotten her through pneumonia or whatever, then we throw obedience back down. We practice it in the church like that. You let something happen in somebody's life, they run down to the church, and they ask the preacher in the church to pray for them because life is falling apart, and as soon as life is halfway back together, you don't see them at church anymore. They're practicing righteousness when it's good for them. But when they don't want it, then they want to go somewhere else. They want to be somewhere else. And Paul is saying to the church, we gird ourselves with truth, and if we gird ourselves with truth, then we're going to obey that truth. We're going to practice what God says. It is practical righteousness. It is simple obedience to what Jesus has to say. When do we get in trouble in sin? When we disobey God. Did you ever commit some great sin when you were totally being obedient to Jesus Christ? I'm going to answer for you and say no. So he tells us if we're going to stand, if we're going to stand firm, then we must be truthful people. We must give up our lies about ourselves. And we must become obedient people we must obey what God has to say because God knows better for us than we know for ourselves. He takes us then to a third piece. Remember, these are pieces that we don't put on when we want them. These are, this should be everyday parts of our lives. This should be seen every day of our lives. He says in verse 15, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, peace is the main word in this part of, of the verse here. And he is speaking about peace with God, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, he's not talking about the gift of evangelism here. He talks about that in Corinthians. This is, uh, this is, he's talking about something that is permanent with us. Peace with God. Peace came through salvation. And that peace remains in us as we're obedient to God. Peace is one of those elements in our lives that when we have peace about a situation, it is one of those elements that lets us know that we are walking in God's will. When we do not have the peace of God abiding within us, then it tells us that we are out of God's will in some way or we're headed into sin or we need to stop, we need to back up and turn around. Peace is one of those elements in our lives that lets us know that we are where God wants us to be. So he says that we should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace with God and peace with man. Now, when we're at peace with God, we are going to share the gospel. This is speaking about an, an area of our life of readiness, being shod with the gospel of peace. Are we ready to share our lives with anybody else? Are we ready to share our lives with people that are lost, with people that are hurting, with people that are struggling? If we don't have peace in our own lives, I can guarantee you right now, you're not going to be sharing your life with anybody else. You're going to be saying, man, my life is a mess. You know, who would want to hear what I have to say? 
And they're really telling the truth. Who would want to hear what you have to say when you're wallowing in sin and trying to act like everything is all right? So he tells us these first three things need to be common, everyday, constant parts of our lives. They're not things that we take off and put back on. We should be truthful people, girding ourselves with truth. We should be people of obedience. Our righteousness should be something that we do. We do the right thing. And our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. We're at peace with God and we're at peace with men because we are not cheating them. We are treating them fairly. We're doing them right. We are being Christians in a lost heathen world. He says these first three pieces must be in place if we are going to stand and fight a spiritual battle. We are not able to stand and fight the spiritual battle when we lack truthfulness, when we lack righteousness, and when we are missing peace with our Heavenly Father. We won't even get to the, the the rest of the parts of it. We've already fallen. We're down in the mud already and being trampled by the enemy and we just want to give up and say what's the use God's armor he then takes a step for us and says when truthfulness and righteousness and peace are in place then there's going to be times in the battle that you're going to need to take up some other pieces of armament he changes wording and he says here he's not saying take up he's saying In this verse 16, taking, above all, taking this, and take the helmet, and take this. So let's walk through two of these. I want us to put our shield and our helmet together as we think about the protection of the armor. If the truthfulness and the righteousness and the peace give us power to stand firm, and it does, we can stand firm when we are at peace with God when our deeds are right, and when we know that we are being truthful people, that's the power to stand. But the protection that you and I are going to need that's going to keep us standing is we've got to engage in the battle. And he says in verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, Paul would say to the Corinthian church that there's no temptation that is taking you but such as is common to man. And that God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. So he's made us a promise that any temptation that comes our way, that God has equipped us to say no to it. If we say yes to it, it's because we are rebelling against God And we are doing it because we want to. And so he tells us in this 16th verse, he says that faith is like a shield. It's like a piece that we protect ourselves with. These Romans would have a shield about two feet wide, about four feet tall, that they could literally get down behind. They could put them side by side and and just make a long row of armament there that would protect them against the arrows that were coming. It, It was a tremendous shield that they had. They could put their whole body behind it. Faith is something that you can put your whole life behind. Faith, he's not talking about our saving faith, our salvation. He's talking to Christians, so he's not talking about that aspect of faith But he's talking about living faith. That act of believing and trusting God every moment of our lives. Do we believe God? When we exercise daily faith, we're we're believing that what God says is true. We're putting up our shield of faith and Satan is telling us a lie. And God's truth is on this side, our shield we put up. And, well, you go to the uh, wilderness temptation of Christ. Satan comes along and he sends the flaming arrow to Jesus and says, you know, you're hungry, you hadn't eaten in 40 days, why don't you turn the stones to bread? 
Jesus puts up the shield of faith and says, that's not what my father says. My father says that man shall not live by bread alone. And he stops the temptation that Satan has shot his way. You and I do it the very same way. It's the reason we need to know things like the Ten Commandments and the Word of God. So that when Satan sends a thought our way, a flaming arrow, we can put up God's Word, we can put up the shield of faith and say, but God says, but God says. And if we believe what God says, then we can live by it. Can you see the interconnection here? The truth that we've girded ourselves with, the truth of God, and we are truthful. Our righteous breastplate, our right actions, our feet shod, the peace of doing that which is right. You know the peace of telling the truth. You know the peace of doing what's right. He says we take this shield of faith because Satan is not going to give up It doesn't matter if it's your job, if it's your marriage, if it's your kids, it's your neighbor. It doesn't matter what it is. Satan is going to tempt you in some way to destroy your life, to destroy where you live, to destroy everything about you, to destroy your church. And he's going to send these temptations, these flaming arrows, he calls them, that are filled with doubt, that are filled with anger, that are filled with accusations. And we put them off by faith, by believing what God says over what Satan says. We go back to the Garden of Eden and we find Satan coming to Eve and and saying, talking to her about eating the fruit of the garden. And she says, he said, God said we can't eat of that fruit. And Satan said, has he really said that? Is that actually what he said? He sent the flame and arrow, the temptation. And what did she do? She wound up eating it. She wound up believing the lie instead of believing God. And you and I have repeated that ever since Adam and Eve in the garden. Paul tells us the way to stop that is by faith, always believing what God says over what Satan says. If it does not square with God's word, then it's not God speaking it. How do they detect phony money? They don't sit around and study phony money. They simply study the original bill. And when you study the original bill, anything that doesn't look original, then you know that it's phony. So we study the Word of God, and anything that doesn't square with the Word of God, we know that there's something wrong with it somewhere. So we put up our shield of faith, which is that we believe what God says as opposed to what Satan says, whether he says it through the world, through the media, or through our next door neighbor. Our shield of faith, believing what God says. And then he says, I want you to take the helmet of salvation. Now, a helmet was something that they did not wear all the time. They put it on when they went into battle. And the helmet of salvation is not speaking about our salvation experience. We don't don't take on and off our salvation. But our helmet of salvation is that security that we have in Jesus Christ. It is that security that God has saved me and I can't be taken out of His hand. I am securely in the hands of God. Now, you want to meet a Christian that gets nothing done in this world for God. You meet a Christian who believes that they can lose their salvation and get it back. And lose it again and get it back. They spend their lifetime in doubt. Am I doing the right thing? Have I lost my salvation? Am I saved right now? Is God angry with me? Have I messed up? And Satan is sitting there laughing at us. Salvation is a work of God. It's not a work of you and me. He saves us. We are eternally secure in the hands of God. But Satan comes along. There's not a person in this room that at some time in your life, Satan has not challenged you on whether or not you're truly saved. 
We've all been through those times of doubts in our lives, wondering, well, am I really saved? If I was really saved, would I have said what I did? Would I have done what I did? You know, am I? And the doubt just flies. He brings us back to the helmet of salvation, that we are secure in the Lord Jesus Christ in the work that he has done. I am saved, I'm sealed, I'm secure in the hands of God. <coughs> Excuse me. But this helmet of salvation, it then guides my thoughts. And it protects my thoughts. If I know that I'm saved, then these evil thoughts, these wicked thoughts, these lustful thoughts that come into my mind, that it come, I can immediately stop them out here. Because my helmet of salvation says I'm saved and I belong to the Lord and those type thoughts don't. Those doubts, even about my salvation, do not belong here. Folks, we need to be secure in who we are. Could you imagine going to work every day and people saying, saying do you really work here? Well, I think they hired me. Are you sure they hired you? Well, I think I did. I signed something. Well, I don't mean that you're hired here. You know, you, you, you'd walk around all day long saying, you know, do I do anything? Do I, do, is that really my office over there? Is that really my desk? I wonder if I'm going to get a paycheck on Friday. Uh, you'd be worthless. And we, we have Christians walking around like that because their minds have been so filled with doubt and confusion. He says, put on the helmet of salvation. So what do you need to do? Maybe you need to take this week and say, Lord, I need you to firm, firmly set in my life that I know that I know that I'm saved. I need to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Take me back to the place of where I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. Take me back to the foot of Calvary. Father, let me relive whatever I need to relive. I need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am a child of God. I need to settle it once and for all so that as I walk forward that I will have the protection that when Satan comes and says, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have done that, you can say, I am a Christian, Satan, and my Savior has already paid the price for that sin, and if he's taken care of it. That's between me and my God. We need to be able to push Satan back. We're in a battle. We're standing firm, remember? We're standing our ground. If you're concerned about your about the truthfulness in your life, pray about it. Ask God to show you. Are your actions righteous? Talk to Him about it. If you don't have peace with God, show it, ask Him to show you why you don't have peace with Him. Your shield of faith, if you're not believing God, ask Him to deal with you about it. That you would become a person who believes Him. If you're not sure about your salvation, then ask Him to take care of that area in your life so that you can become sure can stand firm. So we've looked at power and we've looked at protection. And then he's going to talk to us about the provision of the armor. What does the armor provide for us? And he takes us to the end of verse 17 and he says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is, he tells us directly, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. This book that we hold in our hands right here. This is the sword of the Spirit. If you've got your hand on it, you've got your hand on the sword that he's talking about. This is it right here. This sword would be a two-edged sword. He tells us that it cuts and it divides to the bone, the marrow, to the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is a sword that gets sharper with every use. Now, wouldn't you ladies like to have a kitchen knife like that? You go and you get a knife out of the drawer... And the temptation says, that sorry husband of mine hadn't sharpened the knives again. Because a knife just gets dull. If you use a knife, it's going to get dull. And if you use a sword in battle, it's going to get dull. And God bless the person that can sharpen a knife. Not everybody can sharpen one correctly. But the Word of God is a sword. It is the Word of God. It is the sword of the Lord. And 
it gets sharper every time you use it. Every time you open this book and read it, it seems like that sword cuts a little cleaner and a little finer and goes a little deeper into my life. That sword of the Lord, it seems to be able to enter into our lives and to cut away that which is not needful. Now, there's been men throughout the Bible that tried to use a physical sword instead of a spiritual sword. Moses thought that at the age of 40, he could just start killing Egyptians and bury them in the sand. But he was going to have a big sand pile, wouldn't he? It didn't work. He killed one, and he ran for his life and spent 40 years tending sheep. Peter thought, I just take a sword and I'll start cutting off the heads. And he got the ear of the guy, but he, and Jesus had to stop him and said, you're using the wrong weapon. Moses found out that he could stand with the rod in his hand and proclaim, thus saith the Lord God, and that he could, that all of the enemies of God would fall down. He found out that when he proclaimed the word of God, that oceans would part. He found that when he proclaimed the word of God, that plagues would come and plagues would go. He found that when he proclaimed the word of God, water could come from a rock or enemies could be defeated. Moses found that the greatest weapon he had was the Word of God. It was what God had provided him with. Peter found out that the Word of God was more powerful than a sword. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he got one ear. At Pentecost, he got 3,000. As he spoke the Word of God, God cut through the very heart's of 3,000 people, and they trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's the power. That's what God provides. The, the provision of the armor is the Word of God. Do you know that the Word of God will continue to do that today? Whether it's you, or your parents, or your children, or your grandchildren, or your neighbor, God's Word is still what He has provided. You and I need to read this word. We need to let it do surgery on us. We need to let it trim away from us. We're always wanting to lose a little weight. We need to let it trim on us. I read a, a story one time that I think uh, fits us here. And a man was sitting in a park just watching, you know, the people watching thing. I don't know if any of y'all ever do that. You know, at Walmart, you do the people watching thing. But he was sitting in the park watching people. And he said, along come a butterfly. And there was a bed of flowers out there. And he said, that old butterfly would just land on a flower, and then he'd float up and land on another flower and float up and land. He said, he was just floating through life. Just float along, bloom, 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 bloom. He thought, well, I guess that's all right, just to float through life. He said, along behind the butterfly came a man. And he was interested in the color of the flowers, and he was making notes about the roses and the color of the roses and this and that. And he said he had him a whole notebook that he was writing in and making sketches and just looked at the flowers and went away. He said, well, I guess that's all right, too. You can look at life. Maybe you can learn something from it. Maybe you can go away. He said, and then along came a bee. He said, and that busy little bee would land on a flower, crawl down inside it as deep as he could go, get his full of the nectar that was in that flower as he could and fly back to his hive and deposit it. Come back empty, crawl back to the depths of that flower and draw out all he could again. Go back and give it all away and come back empty. He said, as I pondered those, he said, I wanted to be like that bee. When it came to God's word. 
I wanted to come to, to the Word of God and crawl into the depths of it and hear what God had to say. And I wanted to leave full of God in His Word. And I wanted to share it through being a truthful person, through my righteous deeds, through my demeanor of being a person that was at peace with God, through my faith, believing God instead of what Satan had to say, through my helmet of salvation of being firmly secure in what I believe and not being swayed by the trends of this world. And taking that word and being able in love to share with someone else and give them the same truths that God had given me. I think that's a pretty lofty goal. Maybe it's one you want to take up this morning. Maybe it's one that you want to try on. Maybe I need to ask you, do you float through life? Do you just take note of life? Or do you feel yourself with it? Do you float through the Word of God? Do you take note of the Word of God? Or do you feel yourself with the Word of God? I'm going to go ahead and tell you up front, you have really nothing worth hearing, nothing worth sharing, unless you dig it out of this book right here. Because the things of this world will pass away. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing in this world that I have not tried. Nothing in this world I haven't done. And it's all vanity. Every bit of it. This was the only truth that Solomon could find. I want to encourage you to spend your life filling yourself with it every day of your life. And then going and giving it away. I want to ask Sharon to...